sorry. Uh, my name is Dayo Nguyemi. Uh, I'll be the moderator of today's webinar on uh, master's application. We have um, three resource persons with us and uh, the president of the SI Canada, Professor Kristen. And we have uh, three uh, resource persons, like I said, we have Samuel, we have Joshua and we have Miriam. And I'm just gonna briefly say a few things about them. And then from there we can you know, move on with, with our program. Now, um, I'm sorry. Just give me a minute. Okay, so uh, Miriam is a Masters of Law student at the University of Calgary. And um, Samuel Arau is a research graduate, Master of Science from the University of British Columbia. And Joshua Igalo is currently a Master's of Engineering Science student at Simon Fraser University. And um, I'm just going to give a brief, uh, you know, introduction of Samuel Arau. I have his power here. And just from there, we'll move on. So Samuel is a Nigerian who currently works as an SQF practitioner at Verka Food. He was a bachelor's in biochemistry from FUDO and a master's in food science from UBC. He's passionate about helping Africans access quality education through scholarships. Uh, today, just like we said earlier, we'll be uh, talking about master's application. Uh, we'll be focusing on specifically personal statement, statement of purpose, and um, research proposal. We will be doing this because we know that um, applicants run into problems and trouble while trying to you know, write their personal statement. I've been there before and I understand what it means to <laughs> To, to be writing that, to be preparing your, your personal statement. So uh, the resource persons who have today, they are very, you know, uh, experienced and they've been through this, just like myself and Professor Christian. And I, I know they're in a the better position to discuss this and give you details about how to go about this. And I hope this will help us in our, you know, application process. So I'm going to start with Joshua. I just want to go straight into the, into the questions. And I'm sorry about starting so late. We have just one hour. We, we, we believe we'll be able to do justice, you know, within this one hour. So I'm going to start with Joshua. Joshua, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Joshua. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So Joshua, yeah. So this question, first question is for you. And, and I should mention that if you have any questions, I'm talking about the participants now. If you have questions, please don't forget to put your questions in the comment zone. Uh, section so that we can have your questions and we can re react or respond to your questions almost immediately. Thank you very much. So the first question, Joshua, is what is the statement of purpose? Uh, yeah, that, that was the first question. What is the statement of purpose, statement of intention, of intent? Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. So to start with, um, statement of purpose, it, the, the, the last word in in this in that string of in that string of words actually picks actually describes everything statement of purpose statement of intent it's a written it's a written document that that most applicants to um, most applicants mostly prospective applicants to grad school have to write to the graduate committee to describe their purpose for their purpose for grad school why do you want to it's more or less you're answering the question why do you want to go to grad school why do you want to go to why do you want to come to our grad school why do you want to take up your research in our, our in our in our graduate school so it's a written document mostly a page two pages that describes not just you not just you your history and research but what you have what you would bring to the table if admitted I'm 
So what's up? <laughs> I need to repeat. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, I think someone is laughing out loud there. No. <laughs> I like you. <laughs> I'm a Zoom drama, bitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at this okay. Look at that mouth so camera. The next this question. Is this is Sorry, can we mute that Look person, please? Me, 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 me. You can't fucking. I'm a hacker. I'm a zoom bomber. I will hack your meeting and listen to you say in the chat. I'm a new girl. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so zoom. thank you very much. Yeah. I know. Zoom. Yeah. It's, so, it's one of those things. Uh, yeah. So the next question will be for Samuel. So, Samuel, um, thank you very much, Joshua, for telling us what eternal mm -hmm. purpose is, is all about. Then, Samuel, what, what is the passionate statement? And how is it different from the statement of purpose? Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, a personal statement, like it says, it's the word personal statement is a statement about your personal self. So here is how it makes sense. It is your particular story. It's your independent story. It is your own plagiarized story. It's your own copied story. It is your story that is particular to you. And it shows the things you've thought. So how it differs from a personal statement and um, from it, it's another purpose is that a personal statement looks backward and it's not a purpose looks forward. So a personal statement is telling us about yourself before grad school. Like what what you know, what this is this is this is me. This these are the reasons, these are the reasons I've become me. So, you, you know, so why is it why is another purpose talks about what you want to become in the future? Why you want to go to grad school? Yeah. School that you want that you want to pick up, what contributions you have in grad school and the sort. So look at it in the context that personal statements looks at the things that you have or you have been through before, and the set of purpose looks at the things that you want to become in the future. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for that. So um, so the next question, we'll be talking about the structure of, of a statement of purpose and intent. So just to mention, uh, when you hear a statement of purpose, it's the same thing as a statement of intent, all right? So I can just uh, you know say both at the same time or just forget about one and just go straight to, to the one that comes to mind. So, um, so I'm going to be asking now before I, I go to Miriam. I know Miriam, uh, you know, has something to say about research uh, proposal. But before we get there, let's have a let's have a structure of a statement of purpose. So, what was the structure of a statement of, of purpose, Joshua? Okay, um, there are four structures for a statement of purpose. Um, the first structure structure is the introduction. This is where you introduce yourself, your interests, your motivations. The second the second stage is um where you summarize your undergraduate and previous graduate career. The third stage is where you discuss your you discuss the relevance of your recent and current activities in terms of research. And the last stage is where you elaborate your academic interests. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so Samuel, yeah. What, what, so what is it? What is the structure of a personal statement? Okay, so very very brief. Um, I say this. I like to also point out that um, more often, more often than not, um, uh, the essay to grad school would, might likely have to contain both. For this, so a typical example would be, for instance, if you are applying for something like the Mastercard um, scholarship, where the essays you write are typically personal statements. Yeah, guys, it's of similar purpose. If you go through the the questions, for instance, you see questions like, "Tell us about yourself." You know that personal statement to tell us about what you've been through. Um, show us a proof that you've been that you've been persistent. That's a that's a personal statement. You also see other questions like why do you want to study this course? Why do you want to come to UBC? You know how do you think um, being in UBC would help you? So you can see that that's also is not a purpose. So typically, when you begin to apply for scholarships um, and admissions, you will notice that um, this these two contexts might be used interchangeably. And it depends on the question. So always bear in mind that questions relating to you in the past are likely to be personal statements. Questions relating to you in the future are likely to be sending the purposes. Now, the structure typically, like Joshua has, has said, they are more or less the same. But one of the things that you must note in the structure of personal statements is that you must always land with what makes you unique. Like, of course, you start with introduction, this is me, this is me, um, this is what I've been through, this, this is what I'm studying. So you started, of course, like Joshua said, the introduction and every other 
you know, part of it. But the difference that the difference that you said in your structure in the personal statement is that it must always land with a comp so remember I said it's a pass. So you bring in all of the things like as Joshua said in this context through the point of view now, and then you would land on a note that this is me that is ready to go to grad school. So of course, like I and like I always emphasize, this through might likely show up when you apply for admission. So you might likely have to have a fusion of the both. Yeah, thank you very much, Samuel. And I like I should mention that sometimes um, when you're applying, that's why I said in the last uh, you know webinar that you should try to you know familiarize yourself with websites of the, of the program you you're applying to. You know, in the pro you will see there one of the requirements or one of the things you will see on the website is how to write your personal statement or your your statement of purpose. They will put it there how to write. Some schools will do that for you, and so they make the job easy for you. You just have to put out your personal statement. Like I said, it is your personal story. It is not another person's story. So you can you cannot copy someone else. You cannot copy another person's personal story. I'm not going to talk about what I experienced, but really, some people will go out there and copy another person's story. They know already. They they are, they, they have seen the story before. So you don't want to do that. You want to write your own personal story, your own personal unique story, which will help you in your ad, ad, admission or your application. So uh, I'm going to go straight to um, Miriam now, because I know that, um, you know, personal statement is different from a research proposal. So um, Miriam, what is a research proposal and what is the structure of a research proposal? Um, okay, thank you, Daya. It's, uh, it's a really interesting question. Um, so what is a research proposal? Simple, it's a structured document that explains um, what you plan to research on and why what you plan to research on is worth um, researching on in the first place. And very importantly, how you intend to approach uh, this research. Um, for me, a research proposal does two things, right? The first thing that it does is it's, it's a proof of your ability to undertake extensive research and critical thinking. And secondly, it's a, it's a proof of your writing ability. And I should emphasize that these two things are ex extremely crucial to securing an admission to a graduate degree program. Um, on the structure of a research proposal, uh, you know, it, the, it, the structure of a typical research proposal, you know, would include like your research topic, your research problem, your research question, um, your existing literature, research objective, significance of study and methodology. Um, this, is, this might sound so much, but, um, you can always fuse some edits together. So you can always fuse your research problem and research question together. You can always merge your research ob objective and, and significance of study together. So I'm just gonna touch on each of these headings very quickly. Um, your research topic, there's nothing much there. For me personally, I don't think that your topic, um, um, I mean, it's not what you call your topic for me rather, it's actually the content of your research proposal. Um, but I should, I should also add that whatever to topic you want to go with, just make sure that um, it, you know, number one grabs people's attention. It gives your reader an idea of how your paper would fit into the focus of the program that you're applying to. Um, for research problem or research question, I think personally for me, the starting point for your research and any research should be identifying a research question. And the research question would typically flow from a research problem. So you're identifying, okay, what problem exists, right? And when you're able to identify what the uh, a problem that exists in, in, in literature or in, in, in your field, you're able to couch a research question. And, and I think it's crucial that this marks your starting point because it, it is the one question or two or more questions as, as the case may be upon which the entire body of your research is built. So what I'm trying to say basically is that your research question is going to usually be the foundation of your research. And in addition to that, it also gives your reader an insight as to what your research is, is, is trying to address. And lastly, and most importantly, for a master's student, um, I, I, the advice that I get a lot is that your thesis program is not your life's work. Right, you're expected to produce fantastic work, but it's not your life's work. So your research should be as streamlined as possible, as narrow as possible, uh, so that you can, I mean, the, the idea is for you to go deeper rather than broader. So if you go deeper into your research rather than broader, it um, gives you the opportunity to analyze your uh, concepts, your theories in detail, and you produce a, 
an extremely fantastic work. Um, the second heading would be literature review, but, I, but I'm very careful to call it a literature review, especially in a research proposal, because a research proposal would usually be like, especially for a master's student, probably like five pages max, depending on what the school requires. So it's a really short document uh, to expect that you would actually do extensive literature review. So I tend to prefer to call it existing literature. And, and it, it, you know, identifying existing literature is very important because that's the only way that you can actually find your research problem, right? Because, I mean, I've mentioned the importance of a research problem. The next question is how do you identify one? And it's just, it's just simple, you just need to read you know, do a lot of reading, do a lot of research, uh, just go through literature and try to identify if there's a gap in literature or not, or if there's a gap in some earlier studies that has been conducted in, in, in whatever field that you're, you're interested in. Um, so it's not necessarily a summary of all of the literature. It's just like a general understanding of, you know, what your current knowledge is in, in, in the field that is related to, to your project. And um, you know, it, it's, it serves as a basis for which you can say, you know what, okay, I've read all of the literature. Um, I found that there is a gap in this literature. There's no literature out there that addresses these issues and I want to address this issue. That is a fantastic justification for actually uh, deciding to go to research in, in, in that area. Um, then research objective and significance of study. Uh, just like research program or question, you can, I think personally that you can lump this together because they can, they are, they're similar and they're, they're intertwined. And, and what, what are these? Uh, research objective just describes, you know, what you expect to achieve by your project. And um, the significance is, you know, basically how, how your research is beneficial to the development of, of the field that you're interested in or how it contributes to existing literature um, out there. So it's, it's, it's that simple. Then um, lastly, um, it's the methodology. Um, I've emphasized initially that the research problem and question is very crucial. The methodology is extremely crucial too as well. And um, I say this because it's, it, it's a justification for the results of your research, right? So first things first, you need to find out what type of research methods are appropriate for your topic you know, from the qualitative research methodology to the quantitative research methodolo methodology, doctrinal, depending on your, on your area. And, um, you know, what does the methodology do? Simple, it tells your reader that you have not only identified a research problem, but you've also identified how to answer the research question. And telling your reader how you have chosen to answer this question, you know, either by qualitative or quantitative research methodology, or you're using a case study or an interview, you're telling your, your reader what databases you're looking at and whether you're doing um, um, a comparative analysis, or whatever it is that you're doing. So at the end of the day, all of this gives credibility to your research work. Um, so your, your readers see that you're not, um, your, your methodology helps your research and readings to be focused. Um, and, and honestly, it's, it's really important because for your reader to accept your results or your conclusions or recommendations, they need to know what steps you've taken to reach those results and, and conclusions and to decide for themselves if they are credible and can be accepted. Um, if your methodology is flawed, yeah, and then your results would almost always be flawed and your reader will be skeptical about you know, accepting those results or recommendation. Um, yeah, pretty Thank much. You Thank you very much, Miriam. I, I, I just need to, you know, to say this. Uh, I, I think Miriam has gone really deep into research, how to write research proposal for someone who is already in the, in the program, especially for those who are in the Master of Laws program. I, I know you have actually gone really deep into it. Yeah, I should mention absolutely. that. I know you've really gone into the, deep into it. Yeah. And I don't want a pro, uh, applicant to be to be scared of this because when I was writing my own, um, you know, application, yes, too, yes, yeah. I, I did not know all these things. I did not. I did not know about uh, methodology and all that. And I still gained the admission and I got, you know, wonderful scholarship. So I don't want yeah. you to freak out based on all these things. I just want you to know what is important to you now for your research proposal at this point is that you should know the legal problem that exists and yeah. the solution you're trying to provide to the legal problem. I think that's, that's very important without you know, undermining what Miriam said now. But I think Miriam has really gone deep and she's trying <laughs> to help everyone. <laughs> you know, but, but important thing is that recognize the legal issues and how you want to resolve Problem. the issues. And I need Absolutely. to say something about, I know I'm talking too much now, but it, it's, for, it's for good. I, you know, I, I need to talk about uh, the literature review. 
you know, what basically is saying is, is that, look, there are some existing um, literature on, on these issues. And sometimes you might have a, a particular topic that has been resolved already, that has been written on. It doesn't mean that you should stop writing on it. You, you can have a different opinion. You can have a different conclusion. And that is what you're writing on. You're saying, look, I know this thing exists already, but this is what I'm saying. So don't be afraid to, you know, tackle or go for any existing work that you think is different from your own, you know, uh, view or opinion. Thank you very much. Yeah. So I, I'm going to go to all of you now to just ask this broad question. And I want you to just, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Before then, okay. I, I will need to ask Joshua this so that we don't miss it. Uh, what makes a theorem of purpose stand out? Okay, yeah, I'm not going to stay too long on this because I would also love. Um, I would also. I would love for the part participants to also ask questions, which will help me, which will also help to elaborate more. But yeah. I would say one thing: it's to sell yourself, sell yourself, your research as original as possible, very briefly. It's four keywords, right? Sell yourself, your research, as original as possible, very briefly. What do, I, what do I mean by that? You need to sell yourself. When I mean sell yourself, not your life history. What they need to know. You know what they need to know. When you read the requirements, when you read the requirements of the graduate program, and that's something most people don't go through. Go through the requirements of the graduate program. Go through the... the the, the professors, the professors' um, history, go through, go through that also, go through their research plans and what they've done already. You would know how to sell yourself. You would know how to sell your research. You don't just pick up a random research and just uh, feel like the professor would just add it, add it to theirs. No, they, are, they have grants for this. So there's a particular niche that that grant is for. You need to find a way your research will align with what is already being done in that, in that lab. And you need to be original about it. You need to be very original about it. I'm going to try as much as possible not to deviate into the engineering, engineering sphere and keep it as broad as possible. You need to be original about it. I get the fact that we can all, there are so many sample SOPs on the internet, but they are called sample for the sake of going through them, getting ideas, not to lift and drop, lift and drop. So you need to be as original as possible. And what does originality entail? You cannot just write an SOP one submit you would have to edit over and over and over again because ideas don't just drop once the idea you would have today can be different from what you have next week or what you have next month and that's why most people i'm very sure i'm very sure they've told you in the past before that you need to take some time to prepare for prepare these documents you don't you can't just wake up and prepare this document or model up this document in a week or two weeks and you feel like you're ready to to submit and brevity brevity for me is key one thing during my time I, I learned was not everybody on the graduate committee has the time to read over 300 SOPs. You need to be as brief as possible. And for me, my for me, the standard I've always given given people is keep it as much as possible, keep it on one page. If you are going to leave it, if you are going to move it to more than one page, then let your hook at the beginning be very good because the hook is, is key. For someone like me, if, if I should be reading, if I should be reading an essay, if your hook is not good, I'm not going to go in even half, I'm not going to even get to half of that page. And when I mean hook, that's your first paragraph. If you don't start your first paragraph with, um, my name is Joshua Igalo, I hail from Edo State, this, that, that, and that. No, you have to do a really good hook. And I can't give a hook now, and somebody will pick it up, hook the first. <laughs> yeah. So then if I give a hook right now, someone will pick it up and say, oh, because Joshua said it, this is the hook I'm going to use. Hook the first. For some people, it could be from an emotional stand standpoint. For some people, it might be from an economical standpoint. Whatever you use, let your hook be good enough. And the essence of the hook is for this. If you know you can't keep everything as brief as possible in one page, have a good hook, good enough for anybody who is reading it to know that, okay, I'm going to want to go through this thing more than a page. Let me, let me keep reading. Even if it's more than a page, let me keep reading. Because if the hook is no good, you look at it and you're like, ah, two pages, come on. I don't think I can go through this. And that's it. And definitely, I'm pretty sure that from experience, you heard it time, time and time again that statement of purpose is one of the things that, that determines whether if you gain admission or not. It's not just it's not just your transcript, it's not just your resume. Yeah, they want yeah, to know yeah. if you can write. Yeah, true. Thank you very much, Josh, for, for that. So I'm gonna to go to Samuel now, just I, because I know so many questions are waiting for us already. 
but let's just go through our you know <laughs> questions first so that we can address those ones later. So um, Samuel, so what makes a personal statement stand out? Uh, Joshua has done plenty of work. <laughs> so so, um, so we all here, we're Africans, right? There's something about when you check an application page, you see that the rights we um we 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 acknowledge or we accept um people from underrepresented communities to apply. Um particularly you see them mentioned underrepresented communities and women. So one of the strongest hook I think for Africans to begin to consider to use is to talk in the because most applications really all over the world. The, the 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 ones people that are underrepresented like Africans to apply. So that's so that on on its own um, is a strong hook. And that's what I used and I still use anyway because I'm still African by the way. So that's one of the strongest hooks. Um I think you um, so please don't leave my hook but if, <laughs> you know, understand that you're underrepresented in your village you might only be the person the only person that doesn't I wasn't the BSC <laughs> just for instance anyway. But that's a strong hook. So yeah so you can also consider doing that often. Um, if you can. Okay, thank you very much, Samuel. I know, I know, people are just very scared about dropping something there so that people don't leave. It. <laughs> I, I know I reviewed some application um, document and I've seen the same thing I wrote for my, you know, master admissions into you know different schools. I've seen them and I'm like, oh my god, I'm not writing again. I'm not the one in this situation. <laughs> you know, so please be, just be careful. So, um, Miriam, Joshua, and Samuel, this is a question for every one of you. And once one, one person is done, I just want to go to the next person. So I, I will start with Miriam. So do you have to contact your prospective professor with your statement, with your statement of purpose and research proposal prior to the application period or during the application period? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, what I'll say is it depends, really. It depends on your program. It depends on the program requirements. So the first thing you should do if you're going to apply to any university is to go through the university, um, the website, and look through the requirements to confirm whether or not you will need to um, have to contact a supervisor or not, um, but there's a there's a there's a secret that I, I like to you know share with um, students who are coming into programs that you know they'll tell you oh it's not important to to um, to get a supervisor. It's true that it is not important to get a supervisor. It is true that it is not required to get a supervisor for that program, but sometimes it could also help your chances. So even if the program says you know what you don't have to reach out to a supervisor, it's okay if you decide to reach out to a supervisor because you know most programs, most graduate programs um, are largely dependent on whether or not there is a supervisor available to um, supervise your research. So if, if there's no supervisor available, no matter how watertight your documents are, your application is, you probably might not get the admission. Um, so it's, it's usually okay if you'd find the supervisor on, on, on the faculty web page and you think that this is somebody that you absolutely want to work with or this is someone that you know has the same similar research interest with you then it doesn't hurt to reach out to the person you know ask questions um ask if the person can potentially be your supervisor and you know i mean personally i think it, it also helps your chances because you're you know that you know even if you're if you're getting into the program even if you're um, you're not going to be faced with the situation of oh, no available supervisor. If you cannot identify someone who is willing to risk, um, to supervise you, then you'd know that, you know, okay, I mean, the chances of getting in the program might be a little bit slimmer because, you know, you might not have a, a supervisor. So in a nutshell, if your program requires that you get a supervisor, please get a supervisor. If your program requires that you don't get a supervisor, you don't have to get a supervisor. However, it is, you know, good to try to contact some professors and have conversations with them before admission. Thank you very much, Miriam. That, that, that was solid. You know, I just, I just like to corroborate you. You know, what I'm trying to do here is not to freak people out or make you feel some, somehow overwhelmed because you're applying for a master's program. Look, don't feel overwhelmed. You will get it. When I was applying for my own master's program, I did not have any supervisor. I did not know anybody, but I did my research to know who were the, you know, strong professors in that faculty who would determine or decide. Professors who would say yes, and nobody can say no. And I was able to identify two people and I did not contact them. What I did was to write something that they might be interested in. So I looked at their, their profile mm -hmm. and I saw mm -hmm. they assisted what they've been doing 
like the their recent work. I, I saw that and I was like, okay, this is good. And I wrote something that they could not resist. So I didn't, like I said, I did not have anyone. They didn't give me any yes or no answer when I was applying, but I got the admission and I got the scholarship. So uh, I, I must say that we are not dealing with funding today. We will deal with that in a separate webinar. But I, I know some of the resource persons who might want to say a few things about it, maybe. Uh, but today is just for personal statements and similar purpose and research proposal. We will have a session for that, a separate session to deal with questions on funding and, and all that. Yeah, so I'm going to go to um, Joe, Samuel now to just respond to the same question that uh, Miriam just responded to uh, about uh, do you have to secure a, a supervisor first before you, you apply or, or okay. what, what's going on yeah. in your field? Very, very briefly, very, yeah, very briefly. In my field, of course, I'm doing food science, chemistry, biochemistry, any STEM courses that you know that you have to work with the level of laboratory schools. Of course, you need to secure a supervisor, depending on whether the admission is thesis based or non thesis based. So, for thesis based, you need to secure a supervisor. Okay, thank you very much. So, briefly, you need to have someone. And I know the, I know the view is different because uh, uh, this is science. Miriam is talking from the perspective of law. And Samuel is talking from the perspective of science. So, let's talk about engineering now. So, Joshua, do you share the same view? Um, I think Joshua is muted, so we can hear you. Joshua, I think you should mute yourself, please. Yeah, 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 sure. Thanks. Um, as an engineering grad student, you have to you have to contact the supervisor first. Um, but this is the thing. The, the 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 hack to it is this: as an engineering grad student, you you have to conduct a supervisor, informing them about your interests and what you have to offer. What you have to offer. That what you have to offer is not the statement of purpose. It's not the statement of purpose. What you have to offer could be a research paper or a very brief research proposal. Like when I mean a research proposal, it's not the research proposal you would submit when you are preparing for your thesis defense or about to start your thesis. It's a very unofficial research proposal, just detailing what you have to offer in terms of research regarding what's going on in, in the lab of that, that professor at the moment. So yes, you have to yeah. contact, you have to contact the supervisor. But there was an, there's another question to that there. Okay. Okay, research proposal. Yeah, then now for research proposal prior to the application period, it differs from schools to schools, depending on engineering. And even in some schools, it differs from um, professors. Some professors will not require you to have um, a um, research proposal. Some may even give you a quiz. And, you, and I have a colleague who has to the quiz before, before you start communicating. So it, it, all, it all depends on the professors. On the professors and also depends on the schools on, on, on the university too. Okay, thank you very much, George, for that. So I'm going to go to the uh, other question, which is about the length of a personal statement, the length of a statement of purpose, and length of a research proposal. So uh, I want you guys to just respond to this. So what is the appropriate length, Miriam, of a research proposal? Um, what is appropriate is what the university says is appropriate. So like. Right. I had said earlier on, just check what the requirements are. If the university wants five pages, pre please prepare a five page document. If the university wants one page, please do not prepare more than a one page document. Thank you very much. Solid. Samuel. Yes, sir. So what is the appropriate length of a personal statement? To be honest, um, I've always written one. To be very honest, I've always written one. So I don't know what's appropriate, but I've written, always written one, you know. So just keep it as, as brief as you can. One should be fine. Solid. Uh, and Joshua, what is the appropriate length of a similar purpose? I'm um, speaking as a speaking. OK, let me not speak from an, as an engineering grad student. Generally, um, like as Miriam said, follow the requirements of the school, of the school. And if the school does not give you any, any form of requirement, SOP, one page. One page, and when I mean one page, font times New Roman, um, font yeah. size four, spacing 1.5. You cannot clump everything together. And for research proposal, if the school doesn't give a requirement, and if it's an unofficial research proposal, when I mean unofficial, what the, the professor is asking you in terms of once he wants to know what you have to offer, 
one page as brief as possible. Yeah. Keep in mind, these people don't have the time or the, I feel like we are even cheated by cheated with time in this part of the world. They don't have that kind of time to go through everything. So that's if they don't, if there is no requirement. So you stick with that. Okay. Let me also let, let me also say let me also say something, Joshua. Um, um so I am I'm I'm willing to um like so like I said, my my, my PhD professor gave me a one page brief proposal that he made for me um sometime last month. So so and uh, of course I'm willing to share that with any science based student. <laughs> Don't copy it though. It's, you know, it's not give you it's not give you fun, you know, just so you see how a one page in the sciences would look like. So I'm willing to share that as well. Okay, thank you. Can, add, thank can you I please add. add one thing, please? Like I have okay. a thought in my head that could also help with preparing your personal statement or your um, statement of purpose. And it's the first advice I give people. And I tell people your statement of purpose of, or um, personal statement is not a rehash of your CV, right? You are not going to mm. reproduce what is mm. in your CV in your personal statement, it doesn't work that way. And that's a problem people have. And that's why when people write personal statements, it tends to run into three, four, five pages. No, that's not what you're expected to do in a, in a personal statement. What you're expected to do in a personal statement is to identify your strengths, right? There are a lot of things on your CV, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're all your strengths, right? Identify your strengths in your CV. And very importantly, those strengths have to be related to what your program is. So for example, your work experience and, and things like that. So you're not just gonna say, oh, I worked in this particular organization for five years. In your that is something that you would do in your CV. Yes, what would you what you would do in your research proposal is possibly pick up a piece of work that you you'd done, right? Or a trans if you're a lawyer, if you worked in corporate commercial, like a transaction, which is what I did in my personal statement. I just picked the transaction that I'd worked that I'd done in the energy related field and I emphasize on some of the works that I did that I felt were outstanding and I felt would you know sway the readers to actually you know see that you know I have the ability to undertake extensive research I have the ability to you know do critical thinking and you know things like you know if you've done a presentation in the past or if you've written an article you can just you know you know tell your researcher sorry tell tell your story in the in the personal statement saying you know what um, I um, did research in this area and these were my findings. Simple, just straight to the solid. point. These are things that you can't do in your CV, but you should do in your personal statement. Solid, um, solid. To quickly add something, please. Um, I want you guys to see it this way. Your statement of purpose is an avenue to explain your, your, your CV. It's an avenue to explain more because the, CV, the resume is always reduced to probably a page or two, but it's, it gives you the opportunity to, to explain more or hit key key points in your in your on your, on that, that that way on your resume. So you guys should also see see that way. And I also wanted to, I wanted to add something, but I think I think I've forgotten. I'll, okay, I'll don't worry, I can I can cover you. So yeah. in my own case, in my, I'm just going to use my own personal experience now. Like in my own case, I wrote what I was passionate about, like what I was passionate about, what I've been doing all my life, and I wrote I wrote about the cases I did. For law, I'm talking about law now, uh, the cases I did in that area. I've done so many cases, but I, I ensure that I connected what my personal experience, what I'm passionate about, and the experience I had, you know, doing some cases. By the way, I wrote about the right to be code, and I was writing about rights, human rights, and all that. So it was easy for me to just, you know, uh, you know, put everything together and make it very interesting for, for the person we're doing. And I should mention that, you know, there are so many applications out there. People are submitting applications. You can have over 400 applications. You can imagine if you if you have submitted something that is not very unique, you know they will just abandon your work and go for another person. So you want to be very unique and you want to make sure that what you've written is is is, is cool. And I should mention that you should give people your research proposal to to to, to review for you. You know you should give you should send your research proposal your personal statement to, to people to review and give. A, an objective opinion. Don't 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 send it to your friend and expect your friend to say yes. You have done it well. Yeah. Don't send. I, I'm not saying you should send it to your enemy too, but send it to someone <laughs> who is experienced in that in that area who can give an objective view about what you've written. Is it cool? Like, would this be interesting? Tell the person to be objective. Don't let the person say, oh yeah, you are very cool. I don't give some stuff to people when they write to me. I just tell them, look, this is. I tell them the truth about it because I know it goes a long way. You get so you want to send it to people to review for you review 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 and review you don't have to and again i have to say this you have so many months for your application period 
You don't have to submit the first week. Yeah. When I submitted my, you know, I, I did my LLM at Berkeley. I did my LLM at U of C. And I submitted, I remember that I will always be the last person to submit. I submitted my, my proposal and my application the last day. In fact, it was, I remember I was in Lagos. I, it was the last minute, like, the last minute. And I was like, yeah, I got it. And why I did that was because I wanted people to help me review my work and, you know, give their objective opinions. And I was very sure that, look, this thing I'm sending, I knew I would get admission because I knew I, people who were already in the, in the schools, they gave me the objective opinion, all right? So you want to do that also. So let's go to the question and answer, I mean, questions from, from the comment sessions now. So to be very um, I think I just remembered what I wanted to say briefly. Very um, good. Yeah. Remember when I said, so I said something about um, just in case the program doesn't give you any form of requirement in terms of your SOP, the, not this, the, the page size for the SOP, the, the number of words for SOP or research proposal, and you want to clump, reduce it to a page. Um, advice is this, you don't start writing with the aim of reaching one page. When you start writing, you can get to two, three pages, then you need to start summarizing backward. You move from yeah. three pages first, and start moving backward, backward, backward. That will give you the opportunity to summarize good. If you are really good at summary, some summary writing, you would you would excel well here. And apart from that, also it will give you the opportunity to sieve out sieve, sieve out your relevance, your strong points from your weak points. What are the relevant points and what are the irrelevant points? And at the end of it all, when you hit one page, you have a very, very good statement of. So now I know yourself as a graduate committee member, right? You look at you look at you look at one page and you're like, someone has twelve um four, size twelve twelve and it's one. Point. Let me read. I think something good is here. So so that's the idea behind it also. Okay, thank you very much, Joshua. So I'm gonna go to the questions now. So uh, this person is asking about uh uh. Okay, this is about scholarship. I think we can just wait. Um, okay, so this person is asking, please, is a research um, proposal one of the documents to submit for an application in a thesis-based program? My answer to that is yes. <laughs> I mean, for, for those who are in law, but I, I don't know. Guys, did you get a question? The... Yeah, um, Dario, I think you missed um, a question from Akin. Uh, oh, okay. It says, do you need a research proposal when going for a course-based master's? Oh, I'm just sorry. Right. I mean, I, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's what I'm talking about, the non-thesis. So, like, you wouldn't need that for a non-thesis because research proposal is that if you're doing research, right? But typically, if you're not doing research, you don't need to have a research proposal, I guess. Um, okay. Can uh, I chip in now? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, my opinion is, is different. And my initial standpoint, and if you've noticed, that's why I start from when I answer questions, is it depends on what program you are applying to. I've, you know, I, I know a lot of course based uh, master's students who were required to, you know, prepare research proposals, but right? their length might be shorter than your length. Just, just because it's a course based master's doesn't mean that you're not going to do any research at all. It probably just means that um, you're going to do um a shorter you're going to do a shorter research or research that is not necessarily as extensive as a thesis based student so to your answer i need you to please check the requirements before you apply to the school to determine whether or not you need a research proposal that's solid that's solid uh i'm trying to find the questions now i'm sorry uh okay uh, oh sorry I, I'm unable to see the questions anymore, but if you can see the questions, I, Miriam, can you see the I, questions? I can, I can see the questions, yes. Then this next question that I can see here, I think that you've answered this. Okay, um, I can see the questions now, yeah. Oh, so, okay. yeah, I can see the questions, I can just go ahead. I'm so sorry, guys, uh, for my tardiness, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, so the next question is uh, from, from Jago, right? And it's asking about, okay. It's asking, please, what is a research proposal? Uh, is a research proposal one of the documents to submit for an application in a thesis based program? And I think I answered that already. Um, yeah, guys, do you want to respond to this? Same thing. Like, like Miriam said, just check if it's required. But from the science, from the science base, I haven't seen that. But probably lower in social sciences, you might need that. 
Mm. Well, thesis generally we would most likely need it because it's a research-based program. Um, for sciences, I don't think you asked. Oh, okay. No. Oh, okay. For, for, for thesis or not, even for PhDs, you you don't even need most times uh, you you won't be required to. But of, of course, to be safe, always check to see what check. Yeah. What you need to do. Man. Okay, Prof. I have I have a question for you at the end of the day. You know, by the time we're done with all these questions, because I know you mentioned study permit and all that at the last webinar. So this question is 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 reserved for you. So you guys should wait for it. So um the next question, this person said, uh, I'm applying for a research paper, a research based paper at Queen's University. The world limit for the research proposal is 500 words. I'm in doubt if the structure of a full research paper can fit 500 words. I think uh, this question has already been answered during the, during the, uh, uh, um, you know, what, uh, when we were talking about, about this. But do you guys still want to respond to this? Um, I'm struggling. Where, which of the questions is that? I can't. Uh, this is from Damilola Awotula. She, uh, okay. The person is saying, I mean, doubt if the structure of a full research propo proposal can fit 500 words. Oh, okay, okay, yes. Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. And thanks, Dami, for, for asking that question. And I can absolutely relate with this question. And that is because when I was applying for my um, graduate degree, I applied to more than a school. A school was asking for five pages. Another one was asking for just 500 words. And if you notice when I was talking about research proposal, I emphasized on sp certain aspects over the other. So I emphasize on things like research question over significance of study or objective of research. I emphasized on methodology. I ex emphasized on, on literature review or existing literature. literature. So if you have um, if you have a research proposal and they're asking for just 500 words, obviously, and, and, and I, I think I can say confidently that the person at the other end of the table who's going to be researching, reviewing your documents would know that you cannot possibly write um, research objective, research problem, research everything, methodology in 500 words. So my advice then is just to emphasize on the most important thing. I, when I was applying to the University of Calgary, the University of Calgary required just 500 words from my research proposal. And I had a five paged document that I had prepared for my research proposal already. So I'm like, okay, how do I fit this in? And what I did essentially was just to bring out the research, just a short introduction, first two lines, bring out my research problem, uh, my research question emphasized on it. Then I skipped literature review, I skipped ex existing literature. Um, and then I went on to methodology and I concluded. So if you're, if you're faced with this, I think you just emphasize on the most important part, just emphasize on methodology, research, um, question, a short introduction. Even if you want to do existing literature, you could just do it two, one or two lines that um, mm. say, saying, you know what, scholars have not, research yeah. has shown that scholars have not touched mm. on this area. Just keep it yeah. simple and short. So, Miriam, so you mean like more like an abstract, like if you can do an abstract of what you've written? Yeah, like that. I, yeah, yeah, yes, 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 okay. that's, a, that's a better way to put it. Miriam, this is the yes. question for me. Do you have to give references? Do you have to do you have to give uh, references for all these scholars you're talking about? In your um, yeah, I think you should give references. I think it's important that you should give give references. Um, but I, I'm trying to remember my application now. I think it was I could not give references because it was just a form that I needed to just put in the information <laughs> into the form. But if you're uploading a document, I advise that yes, you do please put references. Okay, solid. So um, this is a question. Uh, from Kelo Azuzu, um, he's asking, how do we, as Nigerian substitute for a lack of experience, research experience when applying for a Nigerian university, as Nigerian universities do not focus on research? <laughs> also, some of us are already out of the university. I, yeah, okay, uh, who, who, who can respond to this? Uh, Josh. Samuel, Josh, um, yeah, Josh. Okay, 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 okay I'll respond, okay, so. Um, maybe I'm not um, a good person to respond, but I'll still say something. So um, you have in Nigeria, we have like internships, right? You have yeah. you have volunteer opportunities that can give you research experiences. So for instance, myself, I did an internship at the at the time. So we make cowbell, right? And then I did biochemistry, but but I did that internship in a food company, and I did a food science masters, and I was applying for a food science masters here. So I could live I could leverage on those opportunities, right? Secondly, other things you can do is to write a review paper. So you can always write a review paper. So a review paper shows your intellectual progress. It shows how you can um, how you can get as how you can understand research work and interpret them. So you can begin to see review papers. Those will show 
your ex the extent of research work that you do I can supplement okay. you know thank you very much samuel but let me just say this to you this is very important because for you to start writing research i mean things now it might be a little late for some people the you did your project they call it project in nigeria when you were finishing your mm -hmm. undergraduate program that is enough experience for you that mm -hmm. research that that uh, project you wrote when you were finishing your undergraduate program it's enough to help you get your admission into 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 the um university here. thank you very much i think that saves you from I, all this um travel. Yeah. yeah i think that can that I, works can i have, a, can I have a couple yeah. of things too as well um yeah so i have a couple of things in my head but before i go and i just want to emphasize on the people on this webinar especially people who are in, still in school if you know that after school you intend to do a master's you need to be very strategic about the things that you do while in school mm -hmm. i knew that i was going to do a master's i knew that i wanted a scholarship and while in school i had already started doing a lot of things that could improve my chances to get um, scholarship or to get admission things like writing an article things like volunteering going for conferences and things like that um, but if you if you did not have the opportunity to do any of that in school it, it doesn't mean that you're not going to get an admission there are just a few things that you can do to in addition to what joshua and Daya uh, and, and samuel had said earlier you can you know volunteer i find that white people appreciate volunteer work and I had mm. always, I'd always known that right from the university. University. So while I was in the university, it was, you know, it was something that I was looking forward to doing a lot because I knew it was going to help me eventually. So please try to do a lot of volunteer work if you can. If you don't have work experience but you have volunteer work, I think that I think that is solid. That's number one. Well, number two, it doesn't, you know, just look for a, a peer reviewed article in your university, write a five page article, 10 page, whatever amount of, whatever length you want to write. Um, articles carry weight, especially for um, thesis based yeah. ma masters. Articles do carry weight. And then certainly yeah. things like, you know, go for conferences, um, go take side courses. There are a lot of courses on Coursera or Harvard X. You just take a couple of courses. I took like three or four courses. You know, your certifications can definitely help. I had a couple of certifications too as well. There's so many things that you can do to increase your chances to get in admission other than work experience, really. And this is thank you. Thank you very much, Miriam. I know we, are, we have no, your three minutes left. Okay. Oh, I know we have three minutes left. We just want to move to the next question so that we can, you know, just speed up things. So I'm sorry, Joshua. I think you you have to say something about it. So this is for me, Sir Shinashi. Uh, should, in case SOP is not part of the requirement for your application, is it advisable to write one for submission? Secondly, is it mandatory for me to get a prospective supervisor first before completing my application? I think we, we answered that question already. Uh, um, yeah. Lastly, can I get a list of research based programs come scholarship opportunities in Canada? We will just focus so, on the so, first question of Sir Nashi. Should, in case SOP is not part of the requirement for your application, is it advisable to write one for submission? Guys, let's respond to this. I think I think I, I think I should I would love to take care of this person's questions. All three. And um, first of oh, okay. yes, we've, we've said this. We've said this already. Follow the requirements strictly. Follow the requirements strictly. I'm going to use this term we use in Nigeria. You don't have to do over Sabi. Follow the requirements mm -hmm. strictly. Yeah, you you might think you might probably be they might you think maybe they will feel like oh maybe probably is good or something. Nobody get time. Follow the requirements strictly. Second question, second, secondly, he said, is it mandatory for me to get a prospective advisor first before completing? Yes, you have to. If it's going to be a research program, you have to. Because most, if you even check, if you, if you start applying, at some point, they will ask, they will, they will ask they will, in the application, they will ask for the, the name of the research supervisor. And in case you don't know, the research supervisor has, once you get a supervisor for a research-based program, they piggyback with the, with the graduate committee. Okay. Yeah. And the last question, can I get a list of research-based programs? This is, what we, this is what we've been talking about first. Um, go and do your research. First thing, just go, go and start. This is where the research starts from. If you have a research foundation, a research background, this should not be a problem. This should not be, be a problem. Yeah. Thank you very much. Joshua, thank you. Joshua, thank you. Yeah. You, can use, you can use and follow. This is where, if you, if you can't do this research, then you can't do anything we are talking about. Yeah. Also, I have just one question from, from Sam. You know, I, I know it's very important. I know, you know, what other people are. So what is the least acceptable BSc degree rating in, in Canada? Does the 2-2 student stand a chance? Prof, I, I will want you to answer this question, Prof. Yeah, Prof, 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 please. Prof, please, we want you to answer this question. 
So this man said, does it two two students stand a chance? Okay, um, there we run out of time. Let me quickly say, uh, admission to Canada right now is very very competitive. In fact, two one. If you don't have a strong two one, you may even have a problem getting admission. Two two, your chances are far far lower. However, if you have two two and you have been away from school for a long while and you have very good work experience to back it up, or maybe research publications to back it up. That means there have been some changes, dramatic changes since you graduated. That may yeah. go a long way in helping you towards admission. But if you are a recent graduate with a 2-2, let me be very sincere with you. Your chances of getting admission into Canadian universities is very, very difficult. I have seen cases of people who have 2-1, who have been refused mm. admission. I mean, the same person has been refused admission twice in almost four different Canadian universities, they have a 2-1. So 2-2, your chances are very, very slow. But there is no harm in trying. It's just that you yeah. know, not to kind of um, dampen your expectation. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. I have an um, experience from somebody that has a 2-2 and has a diploma in Nigeria. Um, so she has a 2-2 um, um, from BSc, and then she did a master's in Nigeria, and then she's applied for, ma for a master's at the University of Manitoba. And when we sent an email and a CV and a transcript, they said, yes, she's, el she's eligible for a master's. So if you have a tutu and you have a master's in Nigeria or a diploma, that can help you. Um, let, let me quickly can add I to say that. something? Let, let me quickly add to that. So if you have a tutu, what I normally encourage people who have a tutu in Nigeria, either do a postgraduate diploma or a master, that will better your chances. If you are a Marion, go ahead, please. Yes, I was just going to say that I, I'm not quite sure. Like from from what I have found over time is that it is not necessarily. So some schools will tell you you need to have at least a two one on your degree. If you are applying to a school like that, if you apply with a two two, you most likely not get in. But once yeah. they once they say that they are looking for a particular CGPA. Some schools will tell you that they're looking for a particular CGP, right? Mm -hmm. And ordinarily, yeah. you think that it would fall in a 2-1. Because of their calculation, sometimes, even if you have a 2-2 and you calculate it, you convert your GP to the Canadian GP, you find that you actually do meet up with that um, cutoff. So Holy. just because you have a 2-2 doesn't... It's not, a, it's not a blank, you shouldn't have the blanket idea that you don't qualify automatically, right? I, I have a friend who has a tutor, I doubt that she has so much on her CV, but still going to a university in Canada and got funding, right? And then I, the first question I asked her was, how did you get that with a tutu? And she was like, oh no, that it's not the tutu that mattered, it was the conversion of grades. And once okay. they, because she was like- She did worse, point, yeah, she did worse. Uh, no, she didn't do worse. The schools usually oh. convert your grades sometimes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I, I agree with I agree with Mariam. something here, Mariam. In addition to what Mariam said, that is possible, and that is possible yeah. if your last two years you have very good scores. Yeah. Some schools don't Absolutely. base your CGP yeah. on your yeah. four years; they base Absolutely. it maybe on your last year or your last two years. So it's possible to have two two, Absolutely. but your last two years result was very impressive. So schools yeah, okay. that use that calculation, you have chances of getting into. Wow. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you very much, everyone. To quickly, add, to quickly add something to what um, Prof said. Uh, outside of even the last two years, from an engineering standpoint, engineering grad school, grad school standpoint, you also have to consider this. If you if if you've proven yourself to the to to the prospective supervisor that you are capable of fitting into their lab, they would speak on your behalf. Mm. And that's why most what most most super most, most engineering um, um, professors here do is that even when you send an, an email, the next thing they'll tell you is in the next two weeks, prepare for so, some sort of um, yeah. test. Yeah. Okay, thank you guys, thank you. I have this last question for Professor, uh, which is about uh, study permit. I know, so this person is asking, um, Wale Gablao is asking, my question is, does dressing or appearance before a VO, that's a visa officer, I guess, have any slight impact on one's chance of picking up the study permit? Professor, this is for you. Um, sorry, for Canadian study permits, uh, Canadian study permits are not done in person. You apply yes. by paper or electronically. You don't even show up at the embassy. As a you matter of fact, study uh, Canadian uh, study permits are processed at the Canadian visa office in Nairobi. So there is no yeah. likelihood of you even appearing in person. So what you need to prepare is your application document, not your, your dressing. We will still have a date for that. We will have a date to discuss study yeah. permit and all that on, on our webinar. So get ready for that. 
So thank you very much. I know we've exceeded our time, but I actually mentioned that I did not encourage people to submit that, you know, to, to wait to the last minute to submit. I only said, give your, <laughs> I did not say that. Please don't go and copy me. Please don't go and say, oh, he said that, wait to the last minute. I did not say that. I only said that, please. I ensure that you review your work, allow people to review your work, your uh, your PS, your SOP, your research proposal before you submit. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you okay, very much. Your yeah, disclaimer is noted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Th thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much, Samuel. Thank you very much, Miriam. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Joshua. And thank you, everyone. Like, we really appreciate you. We will keep this going for you. We care so much about you, and we will do justice. And the thing is this. If you have any questions, you can send it to the, you can connect us, you can send it to, you know, you can DM us on, on Instagram. Nah. Twitter, I'm Twitter, Joshua is on Twitter, I think Liam is as well. So, yeah. And, and, and yeah, and remember the names of the guys who are presented today. You can, you can, you know, attack, uh, how can I put it now? Please don't attack them, but, but just go, go and go to the, uh, you know, private, message them, you know, tell them for guidance. And uh, don't forget, also ask, ask us on our, uh, you know, DM us and we will be able to respond to you. Thank you very much. I'm prof as well. ASI, uh, African Scholars One. Um, yeah. We'll, we'll post it. Just we'll post uh, the um, Twitter handle of all the participants today in our yeah. Twitter feed, so you can follow them and on Twitter or social media and uh, interact more with them. So uh, yeah. after the webinar, I'm going to be posting that in the next ten minutes on Twitter. So go to our Twitter page. You will see the Twitter handle of all the participants in this event. Sorry, all the yeah. presenters in this event today. Yeah. Then you can follow yeah. them. Thank you very much. Please don't 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 be shy. Just you know, a problem shared is, is a problem solved. Uh, okay, I love this guy. Please. Thank you very much. I, I wish you the best in Nigeria and all over the world. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>